uh, welcome to the final lecture of what is modernity. Uh, let me just share my uh, presentation with you uh, so we can begin. Yes, so this is uh, your final lecture in what is modernity, uh, which is also the second lecture on modernity and religion. And in this lecture, we'll be focusing on Islam, a Semitic religion. That's the chapter from Tomoko Masuzawa that you were assigned this week. Last week, uh, I spoke to you, uh, and I'm sure this must have been surprising to you, but I hope that you uh, got some intuition of the racialization of religion and modernity. Yeah, um, uh, especially along, that's what I spoke about, especially along the Aryan, Indo-European, uh, and on the one hand, and Semitic axes on the other. Uh, and it's really a global phenomenon. Uh, it's uh, really not possible to overstate uh, how important these developments uh, have been for the formation of uh, modern concepts or modern identities, etc. Now, within the core itself, uh, within core one or two, within uh, uh, what is modernity, uh, let me show you how this fits. So, uh, you could see uh, core one or two as a series of historicizations of key modern categories. Yeah. Uh, so, categories that we take to be natural. Yeah. We now see uh, at the end of this course have emerged. Uh, absolutely key categories have emerged in this modern period. So first, in the first module, we historicize the idea of progress, which is so important to all of us. In the second module on political modernity, we uh, historicize nation, ethnicity, race, and the state, the modern state, which is, of course, all of these are closely related to each other. Third, we historicize the economy. All of us think that the economy is simply natural. Uh, now we see that the very idea of the economy and the, the economy as a space itself emerged in this period. Then we historicize the idea of the environment. Yeah, so uh, the environment is not something that is separate. An object out there is very much part of history and of uh, our very uh, social and political and world historical being. Yeah, uh, and then finally, in the last module, we historic we are historicizing. Uh, religion slash nation slash race, uh, which I uh, I hope that you now have a sense, are really closely related concepts. Yeah, concepts that are closely related to each other, and I'll illuminate that more in the course of this lecture. Now it's uh, important to understand, and I hope that current events uh, globally really uh, are illuminating in this regard as well. Uh, modernity is a racial order. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing is racial. It's not just uh, within the United States, and I'll say that a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks to the colonial apartheid. Yeah, thanks to colonial apartheid, all of this uh, modern European colonial states were apartheid states. They were racial states. Yeah, and in fact, even nationalism itself, as it emerged, yeah, uh, was uh, is in fact uh, racial. And I hope you, uh, f first of all, have a spontaneous or an intuitive understanding of the fact that there is a close relationship between uh, nationalism and uh, racialism, yeah, or even racism. Yeah. So race is not just limited to America or to the black-white dichotomy. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you can think of uh, this uh, modernity, yeah, the modern period, uh, and this is how uh, you know discourses are organized, institutions are organized, governments are organized, our social lives, etc., are organized as a world historical competition of races slash slash civilizations. Yeah. So th that's a racial order, and on the other hand, uh, by apartheid government, as I said early uh, 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 earlier as well. Yeah, and you read Mamdani. So the racialization is not just limited to the black-white dichotomy, but the entire space 
of colonial society, colonial rule, and then post-colonial societies which inherit uh, those institutions, etc., knowledges, yeah, uh, the apartheid government, yeah, was a racialized government which divided not just between the colonizer and the colonized, made a racial distinction between the colonizer and the colonized, but also racial distinctions amongst the colonized, yeah. Uh, so uh, that 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 uh, that should be very obvious given our own experience in this region uh, as a result after colonial rule or as a result of colonial rule during colonial rule the development of racial distinctions within our society. Now there are uh, uh, so there are also axes or dimensions of racialization. You when you think of race, you just think of uh, of it as being a matter of skin color, yeah, skin pigmentation, yeah, uh, and biology, yeah, that's the first thing you think of. But in fact, uh, if you, the moment you start paying attention and thinking about it and reading about it and studying it, there's a close relationship, as I said earlier as well, uh, between nationalism and and race as well as progress in race, because progress uh, posits um, uh, Western societies. Yeah, or uh, which is a racial idea. Yeah, you you understand that as well. Yeah, it's closely tied in with the idea of white supremacy. Uh, supremacy. Yeah, the idea of progress in nationalism itself. Yeah, so the very idea of the native or the or uh, the indigenous. That's also a racial idea. Yeah, uh, very much indebted to colonial rule, as you read in Mandani. National. The relation between nationalism and religion that should be obvious in the case of our own societies yeah so both in pakistan and now very clearly in india also there's a relationship between nationalism and religion and you think okay this is uh, basically a third world thing but uh, it is in fact very much also a european thing yeah so uh, nationalism and uh, religion both of them the category itself of religion uh, and nationalism uh, co-emerge they emerge together uh, in the wake of the Reformation. Yeah, Reformation and co-emergence of religion and nationalism. Now, uh, you'll say, well, well the, the West is all secular, but uh, I don't know the extent to which if you start thinking about it, how uh, religious, how much uh, whatever is religious identity is a part of uh, Western nationalism. So it's, a, I don't know if you expression uh, Americans think of America as a city on a hill. What does that mean? It's the other term that they used for it was also the new Jerusalem. Yeah. So just as uh, in the Bible, uh, the, uh, the Jews or rather the Hebrews uh, leave Egypt. Yeah. And then come and found in what is today Palestine, a new state. That's the idea. Uh, just like that America uh, is in fact a uh, new Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, there's a book about the close relationship between uh, Western nationalisms uh, and uh, Christian, the, this Christian trope, yeah, uh, of being chosen. Uh, uh, it's called Many Are Chosen. Yeah, it's an edited volume by William Hutchinson and Hartmut Leon, which is in the Habib Library. But of course, you don't have access to that. Many Are Chosen, Divine Election in Western Nationalism. So uh, it's also common. This is part of our anti-Semitic way of thinking. Yeah, it's common for us to think that the idea of the chosen people is a Jewish idea. Well, actually, both this idea and the Zionist idea are actually Christian ideas. Um, and uh, that especially became prominent in the wake of the Reformation and are, uh, you know, very, very prominent uh, in the history of these nationalisms. We are these modern nationalisms. There is also a close relationship between nationalism and language. You know, that should be very, very obvious. After all, the Hindi-Urdu distinction, uh, which really emerged from the 1870s, yeah? so under colonial rule, after 18, uh, uh, 1857, which you, of course, all know about, in the 1870s, with the All India Census, which was kind of the first All India Census, there were no, this is a modern governmental technology. There were no censuses in the past, yeah? So the first census took place, uh, in 1871, 1872, and right in uh, right after that, the Hindi-Urdu distinction. Uh, uh, there's a close relationship between colonial institutions, uh, which in, uh, is not just limited to the census, the, the colonial governmental apparatus um, uh, that was uh, set up earlier, but also uh, new institutions that were set up, including the census, 
uh, institutions of government, yeah? uh, governmental institutions uh, that were set up in the wake of that, uh, that the whole uh, Hindi movement began by Bharat Hindu Harish Chandra. But you'll read more about that uh, in uh, Tamza, in Pakistan and modern South Asia, inshallah, uh, in your next semester. But you might have, some of you might have read about it already in uh, Shamsur Rahman Farooqi's If It's a Sign in Jahan Urdu about the early history of Urdu and the naming of oh, this name. Yeah. So until the late 19th century, uh, uh, this language that we speak over here, it was simply called Hindi. The Urdu was not a historical name for the language. The language was called Hindi. It was called many other things. That's the other thing there. Uh, you know, it was called Gujri, for instance, uh, Dakani. Yeah, there were many names. So it's this modern idea that a language has to have one name. Uh, why should it? I mean, there are every language has many, many different forms and dialects, etc. Why should it have just one name? Yeah. So this is also part of this modern monolingualism, which I was uh, pointing out to you in the last lecture also, that it's a metaphysical we moderns are uh, metaphysically monolingual. Yeah, we have this uh, and it's closely related to nationalism. Yeah? So the, the close relationship between nationalism and language and a close relationship between religion and language. After all, the Hindi Urdu distinction, yeah, uh, which really makes very little sense the moment you start thinking about it because uh, it's not two separate languages. How can they be two separate languages when we understand uh, the, the language? Yeah, or how can a language have a religion? It doesn't make sense. It's a modern idea that uh, the language has a uh, has a religion. Yeah, uh, or, and even scripts have a religion. So in the main, as you know, the main distinction um, between uh, Hindi and Urdu uh, is really the script. Yeah, so the uh, Devanagari is uh, Hindu somehow. Uh, I mean, this is also unprecedented. Yeah, so why would you think that a script has a religion? Yeah, or and the Perso-Arabic script. Yeah, and of course our script over here. Uh, <coughs> Uh, has many letters which are not included in Persian or in Arabic. So that's another part of it. Yeah, because of course we speak Hindi, but by by the lights of modernity, language has a religion, even scripts have a religion, as is obvious in our region. Yeah, uh, so that's also part of the racialization. And that's the major theme uh, of Masur Zawa's text, the reading that you've been doing, is this remarkable relationship between religion and language uh, that emerged as a result of the modern science of language, uh, modern linguistics or uh, philology, yeah, as it was initially called. Uh, um, so uh, in within this, I'm now going to read to you uh, a couple of sections to uh, analyze uh, from uh, the section on the supremacy of infl inflection. Yeah, so you know. If, you, uh, if you've done the reading and you've been discussing it in class, that uh, Masuzawa says that the main distinction, that the reason that uh, Indo-European languages were thought to be superior, it sounds very bizarre today, yeah, uh, were thought to be superior to other languages, yeah, uh, uh, especially Semitic languages, uh, but not just, yeah, uh, was because the, uh, a, fe a feature of uh, in the language of Indo-European languages, yeah, the grammar of Indo-European languages. Uh, it's uh, really uh, quite remarkable if you think about it, yeah. Um, now, th this implies, yeah, so th that the, uh, the language, of course, as you learned, uh, this comes from the fact that language is thought to be absolutely essential by these modern thinkers. Yeah, uh, absolutely essential to, uh, as one of them says, the soul of a people. Yeah, uh, this is also a modern idea that the people have a soul. Yeah, uh, if lang uh, so, I, I, I want you to think about whether this makes sense or not. Now, this has become common. Um, uh, this has become a common assumption amongst us. Yeah. Uh, people in the past, uh, for instance, didn't think that Islam as a language, but we moderns think that Islam is a language. Yeah, uh, so obviously, this is a very, very common idea amongst us now that language is somehow essential to our being. Yeah, uh, this is a quote from uh, a 20th century philosopher, actually somebody who I've been very influenced by, and he says language is the house of being. Yeah, but what he doesn't realize uh, or he does but he doesn't fully take into account and some of the people who followed after him uh, uh, showed out showed 
that, well, if language is the house of being, then it is a very strange house. Yeah, uh, uh, the house is open, it's mobile, things keep moving around. Yeah, uh, and on the other hand, uh, it also excludes uh, both silence and the outside or beyond of language. Yeah? So there is a reality outside of language, obviously, yeah, uh, which it relates to. Yeah, and with which it uh, evolves. Yeah, uh, and it's open to other languages. So language is a very, very dynamic thing, and it also uh, constantly relates uh, to its own outside. Yeah, it constantly relates to its own, own outside or its own beyond. Jaise wo, jaise Ghalib ne kaha tha, aate hain ghayb se ya mazami khayal mein, Ghalib sarir e khama, nawaye sarosh hai. Yeah. So, so the, 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 the thoughts uh, come to you from the beyond, yeah, and then they are, uh, so their uh, language has a relationship to the outside that is not just a vertical outside, but a horizontal outside the world, yeah, uh, and also to silence, yeah, every time you articulate yourself, uh, you encounter uh, uh, this uh, silence, uh, absence, yeah, and it's in the midst of that, yeah, so never forget it, yeah, uh, so uh, even if language were essential in some way, and of course most people are not monolingual, uh, in fact, yeah, uh, but it's certainly not historically, yeah, uh, then there were multiple essences, yeah, uh, and those essences themselves uh, would in fact be dynamic, yeah, uh, and not static. So uh, to get you to see more clearly, yeah, uh, the some of the ideas. I'm just going to repeat some of the uh, passages. I'm going to read some of the passages and emphasize uh, certain of the things to point out the racial character of this language ideology that Tomoko Masuzawa is trying to show us. Yeah. So this is from the section uh, on the supremacy of election uh, or from page 168. She says, most immediately, a family of languages, this is what it says. Yeah? This is the word, these are the very words that we use. A family of languages implies a distinct genealogy. Once again, that's, uh, you know, these are all uh, things that you should be thinking about that imply uh, the racial character of a language. Family, genealogy, apart and separate from other families and their respective lines of descent. Race is after all, all about uh, descent and the lines of descent, yeah? So the notion of linguistic families thus had the effect of suspending and transferring to another plane the controversy that was soon to, uh, to erupt over the single versus multiple origins of the human species. This was a very, very important debate that took place uh, in Europe. And there's a book about it uh, by Justin E. H. Smith yeah, uh, about how racism emerged. And this was very, very important to it. Yeah? So uh, in the past, uh, uh, it was thought that, of course, uh, that uh, human beings had a common origin. During this time, yeah, uh, it, was, uh, it began to be thought that uh, human beings had uh, multiple origins, which obviously uh, spells trouble, yeah, uh, as far as, uh, uh, you know, the possible uh, unity of uh, humanity is concerned, yeah, so in the modern period, this emerged. Philological theories of language groups, such as Humboldt's, effectively preempted this debate from taking place in its own arena, it seems, while implicitly favoring polygenesis over monogenesis, that is, human beings have multiple origins, or they multiple generations, yeah, uh, rather than a common origin, yeah. To be sure, comparative philology itself might never reveal the biological beginning of the species, yeah, so you, that's not what you're going to find out through language, the study of languages, but insofar as this science suggested that several distinct types of languages emerged, more or less independent of one another, and that the spirit, this is again this modern idea that the language represents the spirit of a people, the spirit of a people was coterminous with the type of language they generated, yeah? They generated, once again, generated, yeah? That's uh, uh, literally directly related to the idea of race, where generation, <coughs> that is reproduction. Yeah? It's reasonable to infer that the division of the races, here understood not in terms of differences discernible in bodily features, so, you know, the, uh, the whole uh, racial worldview, 
yeah, is rather confused in this regard. You shouldn't take it because we are given to taking it, uh, at it on its own terms and thinking that it's natural. We don't recognize that in fact it's uh, totally incoherent. Yeah. Uh, so here it's not the biolog uh, the bodily features that we are talking about, but in terms of spiritual, mental, and intellectual qualities, uh, was fundamental and in effect original. Since the differences went back all the way to the earliest traceable moment of prehistory. Yeah, so uh, the uh, like differences of language are in fact uh, racial distinctions. Yeah, uh, even if that, that is not immediately thought biologically. Yeah, uh, this deep division of the races, quote, yeah, implied conversely commensurability and commutability of peoples, languages, geniuses, and spirits belonging to the same family, even if they were separated by a great distance in space or in time. So think of, uh, quote unquote, this modern category of Indian Muslims. So even though we speak uh, Hindi, et cetera, it doesn't matter. Uh, somehow we are Semitic, uh, because we are Muslims, we are Semitic. Yeah. And the soul of the Semitic languages is in us. Yeah. Or the spirit of Semitic languages uh, is in us. Yeah. Thus, the 19th century Englishman could presume that there was an essential tie between him and an Athenian of the 4th century BCE, whereas a medieval uh, Mohammedan from North Africa, you know, so uh, lots of, I mean, most, uh, Plato and Aristotle uh, were very, very important to Muslims uh, and really uh, all over the Muslim world. Yeah, uh, we have inherited all kinds of concepts from from them. Um, but a medieval Mohammedan from North Africa, for all his knowledge of Aristotle, presumably could not claim the same kinship. So there's the idea that Muslims simply uh, uh, transmitted this, so they held on to this uh, uh, inheritance, which was an inheritance of the Europeans, and then handed it over to them, to whom it rightly belonged. I'm talking about Greek knowledge, ancient uh, classical Greek knowledge. Yeah, uh, that's the modern uh, modern way of understanding. Past, yeah, similarly, an ancient Persian could be claimed by a contemporary Prussian, yeah, German, that is, as kin on account of the presumed common spiritual ancestry, even if there was no subsequent historical relation, let alone relation of descent, which is what race is about, directly connecting. Them. So it's, you know, it's completely incoherent, yeah, uh, but very, very prevalent. Another implication of the concept of language family seems to be the capacity to isolate any instances of historical, meaning accidental, transmission of language and keep such cases separate from the question of genealogy or descent. Mere transfer of languages from one group of another, from one group of people to another, which might occur because of proximity, conquest or commercial intercourse, for example, would leave intact the original distinctions separating different families of people. Yeah. So uh, this, uh, as I said, this is very, very clear. Uh, this should be clear to you in the case of Indian Muslims. Yeah. Uh, but then what about the Persians? Yeah who are Indo-European, but they're Muslim, so are they also Semitic? Once again, you know, you see that the language is incoherent. Uh, the Iranis, uh, one of the reasons they named themselves Iran in the modern period, just, uh, you know, 70 odd years ago, uh, was precisely to become part of the uh, Aryan peoples. Yeah. Uh, so on the one hand, they're Aryan, but they're Muslim. So then they must be Semitic. So, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. By this reckoning, Learning another's language or being born into a language of another, so Hindi in our case, would not alter one's inherent identity. Yeah. So the fact that we speak Hindi, uh, uh, which we now have started calling Urdu just over the past century, uh, century and a half, uh, really slowly. I mean, even Iqbal was calling it Hindi, despite the fact that we speak Hindi, uh, it doesn't alter uh, one's inherent identity, which continues to be whatever, Semitic. Yeah. Uh, an American of African descent, descent growing up speaking English, or even more ironically, generations of Jews speaking Yiddish, yeah, which is a European language, the language of their own and of no one else for centuries would not be considered Indo-European, even though their birth languages undoubtedly were. These languages, in fact, would be forever a borrowed tongue for them. In contrast, Germans speaking English or Russian speaking French were merely circulating among their own family, so to speak. And by the same token, the modern European might rightfully claim classical Greek or Sanskrit as his own, as his birthright. Yeah. So you see, it's uh, remarkable. Uh, now we're going to shift to 
the place of Islam in all of this, which is uh, remarkable, though, is really crucial. So she says, we are left incredulous that this sweeping hegemonic idea of Indo-European language, culture, and eventually race could be based on such arcane and seemingly tenuous grounds as the superiority of inflection over agglutination. Nor does it seem to us warranted to draw as brusquely as the pioneering philologist did an immediate equation between the nature of syntax and the cultural character of a people or their religious dispositions. It's really remarkable, yeah, that you think that there is some kind of a relationship between grammar and the cultural character of a people or their religious dispositions. But regardless of what we might think about such theories today, it apparently became feasible, even inevitable, to represent the religions of the Semites, particularly Islam, in the shadow of an overwhelming prejudgment that proclaimed their essential inflexibility. Yeah, this is something that everybody now associates with Muslims, yeah, or literate people, that is, yeah, literate classes, even over here, yeah. Uh, so we're not just talking about the West, yeah. So this is the uh, phenomenal global breach of these uh, modern concepts, yeah. Uh, the essential inflexibility stemmed from and was unmistakably reflected in their language, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Anybody who knows Arabic knows what an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily speculative uh, language. Just, I mean, both Hebrew and the Semitic languages. Uh, I mean, uh, it's very, very generative of reflection and thought. Yeah, thus it came to be widely held that no matter how richly various its worldwide spread, Islam was in its very essence rigid, invariably intolerant and exclusive, incandescently pure, uh, purist with an inherent tendency toward fanaticism. Yeah, uh, now this is very, very prevalent. It's very prevalent amongst the literate classes. Yeah, especially uh, people educated uh, in English, etc. Over here, it should be very familiar to you. So it's not just limited uh, to Gora, so white people. Yeah. <coughs> now, this is crucial. Yeah. So you remember in Stuart Hall, you also read about the place of Islam. Yeah, uh, in uh, in the uh, construction of modern European identity. Yeah, so uh, that's the ch uh, chapter that you read uh, right at the beginning from Stuart Hall, in which he talks about the fact that uh, Islam constituted a barrier yeah, uh, for centuries on end uh, for Europe, yeah, uh, in the mind of Europe, but also quite physically. Yeah, and as a result, the two, I mean, the two, of course, are related. Um, but then, of course, this changed very, very dramatically in the modern period, yeah? 18th, 19th centuries, yeah? uh, especially. Concurrent with this turn of events is a marked change in the image of, of Muslims. Once represented in earlier centuries by the figure of a languid, indulgent, and dissolute Muslim, yeah? so that's what they used to think of. Uh, Muslims when they used to think of us uh, in that uh, before the modern period you know, or in the even into the early modern period, epitomized by the fabulously rich, uh, corpulent Ottoman Pasha wrapped in silk, lounging in his harem, surrounded by all manners of pleasure giving accoutrements. Yeah, uh, this is the way we also think of our own Muslim uh, past. Yeah, um, the medieval past. Yeah, uh, the quintessential Mohammedan now turned into a fierce zenith. Yeah. Uh, this is in the modern period, especially in the 19th century, which we are still uh, living with. A sword wielding, camel riding, desert nomad. He is an Arab. Yeah. Uh, here, one might be suitably reminded that in the 19th century, just as now, the total population of the Afghani, Persian, and Hindustani speaking Muslims, who therefore were Indo Europeans, yeah, that's what we are uh, uh, by this hypothesis, combined with the Ottoman Turks and other agglutinative language speaking Muslims of China. Indochina and the East Indies uh, were together far more numerous than Arab Muslims. I mean, most Muslims in the world do uh, do not live in the Arab world, uh, do not know Arabic. Yeah, uh, but uh, somehow, the, I mean, as as I was telling you, uh, uh, one uh, modern, of course, the modern Arab, actually said to me, somebody with a PhD from NYU, no less, yeah, uh, said to me, well, I don't understand how. Uh, uh, people who don't speak Arabic can be Muslims. Well, that makes most Muslims in the world not Muslims. Yeah. Uh, from this point on, on, however, in the European mind, and not just, of course, because we are all caught up in the European mind. Yeah. The European mind is not just uh, in the mind of Europeans, but also 
uh, in us, in the, especially in the later classes. Yeah. Um, from this point on, however, in the European mind, this overwhelming majority population of the non-Arab Muslims no longer represented the essential character of the religion. Yeah. Well, we all think this now. Yeah. As if there is some essential character uh, to the religion. So this corresponds, yeah, to the modern em emergence of the idea of religion. Yeah. This is very important to understand that the idea of religion itself uh, is a uh, modern construct and just like nation. Yeah. And just like nation is a violent abstraction of community. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, you know, I'm supposed to have some kind of identification. Yeah. With over 200 million people who I've never seen. Yeah. In fact, I know nothing about them, really. I mean, I know nothing about all the people, all the different kinds of people who live in Pakistan. I know very, very little. Yeah. Uh, but supposedly, we are all one. Yeah. It's a complete abstraction. Yeah. Just because we are Muslim and we are not. I mean, it's just all uh, quite bizarre. Yeah. So not only is nation a violent abstraction of community, religion, just like this modern concept of nation, this modern concept of religion, is a violent abstraction of community faith practices. Yeah. I mean, or whatever is called Islam, you know, I mean, it's the sheer diversity of it um, over the entire planet, yeah, uh, is remarkable, yeah. Uh, this objectification of religion, yeah, as if religion, just like the objectification that we were talking about of the economy, yeah, uh, and we've talked about the objectification of the nation, there's also the objectification of religion, yeah. Uh, it's a distraction of complexity, relationality, history, yeah, uh, that that's what's entailed. Yeah, there's now a large literature on the modern invention slash construction of religion. Yeah, uh, and uh, here are some uh, titles. Yeah, uh, you can later look at them because you have the video. You can pause it and see all the different titles uh, over here. Uh, very recent, starting in 1993. Uh, start, uh, just over the past, uh, just over a, a quarter century, yeah, uh, uh, this uh, has, the, this literature has been accumulating, and really now there are just so many studies and very very fine studies. I mean, this is not an exhaustive list, yeah. Uh, there, there there are also some uh, other new texts which are uh, really groundbreaking uh, and very very illuminating, yeah. Um, so large literature on the modern invention slash construction of religion. Uh, and it's part of the emergence of modern European ethno consciousness. That's what uh, that's the term that, uh, 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 as you know, nationalism emerged first in uh, in Europe. Yeah, uh, we studied that uh, and ethno consciousness. So religion was part uh, was part of that. Yeah, uh, though all of Europe was uh, divided. Yeah, in the wake of the Reformation, there were wars that lasted for you know very very long period of time, and in fact, the ideas of uh, nation uh, and nationalism emerged together uh, with the division of Europe into Catholic and Protestant. Yeah, uh, pro these uh, uh, identities were very much part of that. Now, also, you should see yeah uh, how prevalent religion talk uh, uh, religion talk. Uh, is in the modern period. It's because religion has now been closely related to nationalism. In the past, people didn't talk about religion like this all the time. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, literally, in may, probably in just a single day, uh, the word Islam is used more often uh, today than it would have been used in, like, I don't know, 1200 years, right, uh, of history. It was just not discursively very important. Yeah. Islam, for instance, is not. Uh, uh, it's not a very common word. You can just go and look uh, yourself in the Quran. The Quran, if it was, if it was what it was all about, as it were, uh, Islam, then you would think that uh, both the Quran and the Hadith were would constantly be talking about it. But it hardly even mentions it, and it mentions it in a very different sense. Islam is not as a, a religion, but as a disposition. Yeah. So, for instance, the Quran says, ke, you know, momino uh, Islam karo. You know, those of you who believe do Islam. So Islam is something that you do. It's, a, it's an activity and a disposition. Yeah, uh, not a uh, religion. It's a religion as a uh, this has to do this modern thing. Religion has has become a political and national identity. Yeah? Um, something that is identical to you uh, to itself. So now you think Islam is part of your identity. Yeah, but Islam stands as a challenge to you. Islam is something that you want to do. You know, Muslim is 
it's a, it's some it, it's something for you to aspire to. Yeah, it's not it's not something that is already given. Yeah, uh, for you. So uh, th uh, that's the problem with this modern concept of identity, uh, which I've spoken about before as well. Um, now. The other aspect of this you should see, uh, you know, uh, is that it's precisely in this late over the course of the 19th century that in the Muslim world, uh, the idea of the Muslim world emerged. There's a book on it now uh, published by Harvard University Press uh, just three years ago. Yeah, it's called the idea of the Muslim world, yeah? uh, a global intellectual history. And he shows that it's over the course of the 19th century in our in our part of the world. It was really in the last quarter of the 19th century. Yeah, uh, in the time of Sayyid Ahmad Khan. Yeah, uh, and then of course that led to the Khilafat movement uh, because it became the Ummah, the idea of the Ummah. Yeah, uh, which was a vertical idea. Yeah, uh, it was uh, it was not a it was not a horizontal. That is, it was not a, um, the idea of the Ummah was not a political idea. It was not uh, you, you the, Muslim, uh, um, the Ummah is not political community. Yeah, in fact there was a debate about this um, amongst. Uh, there was a debate about this in our part of the world uh, between uh, in the 20th century between uh, Muhammad Iqbal, who we call Allama Iqbal here, and uh, the Amir of Deoband, uh, very different character of Deoband back then, uh, Hussein Ahmed Madni, uh, who insisted uh, they were all with uh, the Congress and not with the Muslim League, and who argued against Iqbal that uh, the uh, Millat, or the Ummah should not be thought of as a uh, political community. Qom, yeah, was a political community uh, in in which case uh, you would be both Hindus and Muslim, uh, Hindus and Muslims were part of the same Qom in this region, yeah. Uh, but they were not part of the same Ummah, yeah. So there, there is not one Ummah. There are many different Ummahs, which are the different religious communities yeah so you would say the uh, the ummah of jesus the ummah of muhammad etc yeah <coughs> now in the chapters that you have read uh, uh, in from tomoko masuzawa this is the structure of the chapters yeah so you have uh, philology and the discovery of a fissure in the european past yeah so this is this uh, european this construction of this modern european identity yeah, uh, they discover this fissure in the European past between uh, the, their Aryan and their Semitic ideology. The discovery of the Indo-European past, which actually happens in India by a colonial official of the East India Company, William Jones, uh, in the 1770s. Yeah, uh, the birth of comparative grammar, and then the supremacy of inflection, which I've just gone over, and then the essential nature of the Semitic. Yeah, Ernest Renan. Yeah, so uh, these terrible, terrible passages about both Jews and Muslims that you would have read about there uh, in that chapter, uh, really very, very uh, demeaning. And uh, and then the next chapter that you read is the uh, further is the rather elaboration, longer elaboration of this idea of Islam as a Semitic religion. Yeah, uh, the problem of Islam for pre-modern and early modern Europe, you already uh, you already had some familiarity with that uh, from Stuart Hall and now Tomoko Masuzawa has also elaborated this for you. Uh, for pre-modern and early modern Europe, Islam constituted a great barrier and a challenge. Yeah, uh, and also uh, intellectually, then the problem of Semitism and Aryanism for 19th century Europe. Yeah, uh, so the first chapter already began with that. Uh, and then Islam, the Arab religion, yeah, by Abraham Tunan, a very important uh, Orientalist. Uh, so you've already read about Orientalism also in the Stuart Hall chapter, yeah. So this is a uh, th this uh, book or these chapters are also a further elaboration on that very important theme of modernity, yeah, is Orientalism, Sufism, and Aryan Islam. Now this is the I just want to say uh, some things about this, which I consider to be very very important, yeah, and so should you. Yeah, so in this modern period, Sufism is configured. Yeah, Sufism is configured or constructed uh, uh, as an Aryan Islam. Yeah, it's something that belongs to the Aryan civilization, the Indo European civilization, or the Perso Indic civilization. Yeah, so first of all, Islam emerges as the most religion of religions. That's not grammatically correct, but uh, I, uh, I put it like that to. Uh, 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 to illuminate something. Uh, uh, so Islam emerges 
in this modern period amongst the Semites, also as the most religion of religions. Yeah, so religion subsequently, of course, becomes a uh, questionable thing. Yeah, extraordinary contempt for Islam. So you know, for both in the West and among secular classes, uh, and also contempt for monotheism. So they'll tell you uh, that uh, you know Hinduism is peaceful and tolerant because they are polytheistic, uh, and they continue. To, I mean, even the BJP, while they're actually murdering people, will say the same thing: that uh, Hinduism is a religion of peace and tolerance, and Islam is violent. Yeah, uh, it's it's remarkable. Yeah, and the same thing with Buddhism. Yeah. So Buddhism is the in the modern period has been constructed as the religion of peace uh, par excellence, yeah, and therefore the most uh, like the West, yeah. Uh, but uh, and this is despite the fact, of course, people continue to think this despite uh, nationalism, uh, Buddhist nationalism, extremely violent Buddhist nationalism in Sri Lanka, leading to massacres. I mean, really a genocide um, over this modern period, yeah, uh, in the. Uh, uh, in the post-independence period, uh, with the emergence of modern uh, uh, modern uh, Sri Lankan nationalism, which is Buddhist, yeah, uh, and also in Myanmar, you can literally see. I mean, just like in uh, Sri Lanka, Buddhist monks tearing apart uh, babies. Yeah, I mean over there, uh, killing with machetes. Yeah, uh, Hindus uh, uh, in Sri Lanka. And in uh, Myanmar, Muslims, yeah, uh, you know about this, the Rohingya, of course, yeah, they're Muslim monks, yeah, um, but yet these ideas are so deep yeah, that uh, they continue to exist, they, they, they practically cannot be uh, falsified, yeah, um, so it leads to tremendous, this uh, dichotomization, this racialization also leads to tremendous cognitive confusion, yeah, uh, and for your amusement, I thought I'd share with you. Oh, oh, where did it go? I forgot to attach it. Uh, uh, I, I, I had attached a little post uh, from the other day uh, in which I was talking about this tremendous confusion that exists amongst the uh, amongst Pakistanis, literate Pakistanis who think that Islam is Arabic. So, in fact, uh, you know, they try to adopt all kinds of um, uh, all kinds of uh, both Arab pronunciation, Arab dress, they write Al Pakistan on their cars, etc., because they think Arabic is Muslim, yeah. Uh, and uh, Arabs are the true Muslims, yeah. Uh, and on the other hand, they say all kinds of racist things about the Arabs. They call them Baddus, yeah. Uh, because, and behind that is their sense that they belong to this superior civilization, yeah, which is the Indic or the Perso Indic. Uh, civilization, which is of course an Aryan civilization, yeah. So uh, tremendous confusion amongst the literate classes uh, right here in Pakistan. But the other thing that this leads to is the minoritization uh, and co-optation of the Sawaf. What do I mean by that? The Sawaf Sufism is not some minor sect or a regional uh, form of Islam, yeah. Uh, uh, the Aryan Islam, as it's come to be thought of uh, in uh, the modern period, yeah, it is the contemplative dimension of Islam. Essentially, what has happened in the modern period, yeah, thanks to this uh, racist language ideology, yeah, uh, that we've all inherited, is that the contemplative dimension of Islam, and it's a very, very contemplative religion, yeah. Uh, which should be uh, obvious, but it's not. All religions have a con contemplative dimension. Yeah, uh, that's a, uh, how could it be otherwise? Yeah, uh, that contemplative dimension of Islam. And one recent scholar has uh, actually this uh, book by Arthur Bula just published uh, in 2016. It's called Recognizing Sufism. We can't even recognize it. It's all around us. All wherever Muslims are, Sufism exists. And this was even more the case in the past. Uh, it's only been obscured very recently. Uh, Contemplation in the Islamic tradition. Yeah, that's the name of the book. Fascinating book. Uh, if you get the opportunity, you should all uh, read it. Unfortunately, there's no PDF on the web. But there's lots of other literature Yeah, to show you uh, the uh, prevalence, yeah, after all, I mean, all the Sufi silsilas begin uh, with Imam Ali, Imam Ali himself, of course, because, because the Prophet called him the uh, Baab al Madina to Yeah, so it's a, in, uh, he's the gate to the city of knowledge, who uh, the city of knowledge being the Prophet Muhammad. So ultimately, with Muhammad, yeah, the, 
And neither Muhammad nor Ali, you know, that is neither the Prophet uh, nor Imam Ali, uh, uh, were of course Aryans. Yeah. Uh, and anybody who has read the Hadith or read uh, Imam Ali's is deeply contemplative. Yeah. And of course, there's a long tradition of philosophy in Islam. Even our poetry is extremely philosophical. Yeah. Uh, and it's all around us, this uh, philosophical poetry uh, as well. Both Indian nationalists and secular and Pakistani nationalists, as well as Iranian nationalists, claim a perso indic that is Indo European or Aryan origin for Sufism, yeah, which is absurd. Yeah, because neither Muhammad uh, nor uh, Ali uh, were Aryans or Indo-European. Yeah, and Sufism is all over the Arab world, even in Saudi Arabia. I mean, the Wahhabis have tried to destroy it, uh, but there's still only 15% of the population. Yeah, there's uh, uh, Tasawwuf uh, is uh, very prevalent uh, in uh, even there. Yeah, I mean, how could it be otherwise? It's all over the Muslim world. Uh, so it's a deeply philosophical and contemplative tradition. Yeah. And what is the Tasawwuf? Tasawwuf, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, how do you metabolize uh, the religion? Yeah. Uh, how do you digest the religion? Uh, you could think of contemplation. That's what contemplation is. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, learning how to live, uh, essentially, uh, your faith. How, how, how else would you, I mean, the uh, if religion, if it is a set of rules, uh, does not tell you how to follow those rules. Yeah. Uh, for that, you need uh, you need contemplation. You also need an exemplar. Yeah. Uh, essentially, it's you know tasawwuf is uh, philosophy as a way of life. It's a become god likeness. Because so there's this Greek uh, from uh, the Greek school. The motto of Plato's school uh, was homoiosis theoi kata to donaton, which meant uh, becoming like God so far as is possible, uh, which corresponds very much to this. Uh, uh, injunction on the part of the prophet, the khalaku bi akhlaq Allah, yeah, cultivate the ethos of the God, which is also called talu, which is raising yourself, yeah, um, uh, talu, uh, making yourself, uh, cultivating yourself in the likeness of God, yeah, which you might call thoughtful self cultivation, which is what the sawaf is all about, yeah, uh, and is also part of uh, our motto, Habib University's motto, of course. So these are some of the things that I wanted uh, to say to you. Uh, congratulations again on completing this rather difficult semester. And I hope you have interesting uh, discussions in your seminars. Uh, Khuda Hafiz.